Today's video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. More about them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm Simon, your host. I'm still one of my writers. In this case, Danny. Thank you, Danny. He's written me a script. Argoton and Beyond, Lost in Phantom Settlements and Map Traps. I don't know what a map trap is, but, uh, and Phantom Settlements. Look, 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 look. Thank you, Danny. Let's dive in. Let's see what it's all about. And, uh, yeah, let's go. After what felt like a long and heavy sleep, you finally drift back into consciousness and find yourself squinting into the morning sun. You appear to be lying down, fully clothed in a deserted field in the middle of nowhere. You've got a banging head, at least two black eyes, an empty wallet, and your clothes are smeared in blood and vomit. Either you were attacked or you had a heavy night down the pub. What a night. More importantly, you've got absolutely no memory of the previous night and no idea where you are or how you got here. Again, still could be like head trauma or alcohol. That doesn't say much for alcohol, does it? It's like, what causes this like horrible situation? Well, it's either getting really drunk or massive head trauma. <laughs> I really hope it's not me who had boozy nights out that ended exactly like this. <laughs> I knew Danny was going towards the same joke as me. He just, it just is there. It's easy pickings. It was different in the days before smartphones could track your location and Google Maps could give you a clue as to how to get home again. Back in the old days, you had to keep wandering around and you hopefully bumped into a farmer or a murderer who might be able to give you helpful directions. But let's say this happened to you in 2008. 2008 was... I don't think there were quite smartphones, but there were... Do you remember... What were they called? They were called like PDFs, not PDFs. PDAs? PDAs? Personal Digital Assistants? That's it. And they had kind of rudimentary GPS on them. Pretty sure that I had one of these around 2000. Yeah, 2008. I think so, definitely. Could be using, could have GPS on my person at that point. The GPS tracking on your phone has given you a good starting point. Okay, I guess these are more, co did I have an i? I don't think I had an iPhone until like 2010. That's when iPhone first came out, right? And you pulled up Google Maps to find a route home. You're apparently in a little town that goes by the name of Argleton, situated between the A59 road and the town green railway station, not too far away from the market town of Ormskirk in Lancashire, England. This itself is a little bit of a worry as you started your night out at the Aquabar and Nightclub in Key West, Florida. It's going to be a long voyage back home. Oh my god. <laughs> you see, where was. Mate, am I in England? <laughs> There was a, a mate of mine, and I'm not sure, I, I feel like it was it's one of those mates of a mate stories, but he had this, I can't remember if it was him or if it was a mate of his, I get the feeling it was a mate, because it feels just unbelievable, but he went out one night at university, and uh, he's, he, his mate woke up on the outskirts of Paris, he'd somehow got on a Eurostar, and was just uh, just in Paris, and I was like, oh god. <laughs> It's going to be enormously expensive to get a last minute Eurostar home. And also, how much was the last minute Eurostar last night? And he was alone. He wasn't with anyone. He just woke up hungover on the Eurostar. Brilliant. Still, let's not panic. A quick search online reveals that Argleton boasts a doctor's surgery, a golf club, a hairdressing salon, and much more besides. If only you had some money left, you could go and get a haircut and enjoy a quick round of golf with the natives while you try and figure out the details of your return journey. Can't say that that would be particularly high up my uh, to-do list, Danny. More up my to-do list would be, why am I in England? <laughs> How did I get here? I was in Florida. The weather was nice. But as you begin exploring the town, you discover something quite curious. There's nothing here at all. Just more dry, empty fields stretching out into the distant horizon. Not so much as a hot dog stand or a signpost or a cow. You don't realize it yet, but you are nowhere. Argleton might have appeared on Google Maps, Google Earth, and online business directories, but it's a town that does not exist. You're caught in a map trap. You can't walk out, and this will inevitably lead to the brewing of dark thoughts in deeply suspicious minds. But what were Google playing at? How did a patch of nothing manage to attract so much local business? And why is history littered with so many fictional locations and phantom settlements that don't exist outside the boundaries of the map? Should I spoil it? Because I feel like I know the answer. I feel like this is... I have one answer that I've definitely heard about, um, but I'm not sure if there's a right run, so I'm going to share my speculation. Maybe you at home are speculating along with me. These fake towns are put onto maps to protect copyright. So Google spends a lot of money, or Ordnance Survey, or whoever, they spend a lot of money doing this mapping. You've got to send people out and use expensive technologies and all of this shit. So they don't want, like, I don't know, 
Bing, well, let's not say Bing, because obviously Microsoft's a big company doing their own mapping, but some fly-by-night mapping operation um, comes along and just rips up all, off Go- all of Google Maps' data and just uses it as their own and sells it or whatever, right? Google want to protect against that. So what they'll do is they'll slip like Argleton into their maps and it's like, this isn't a real place. It doesn't exist. Like John's barber shop is not really there. But then if Google are using, if Google are like looking at someone's map and they think someone ripped it off, they'll just look up, see whether Argleton's on the map. And if it is, they know they stole it because Google made Argleton up. I think that's the reason these exist. I'm not sure. This script's also 14 pages long, so uh, I guess we're going to learn a bit more than that. There are naturally plenty of theories as to how Argleton ended up on Google Map. It's the construction site for the proposed UK equivalent of Area 51, and Google accidentally let the alien cat out of the space helmet. It's ridiculous. Why would Google be privy to this information? It's the real location of Hogwarts. Wow. It's an ancient settlement which mysteriously disappeared under tragic circumstances thousands of years ago, but resurfaced in 2008 after a journey through a time portal, what with hairdressers and all. It hides a secret meaning, with earth-shattering consequences known only to Google. Or it was a simple cock-up. Whichever way Argleton found its place on the map, it was first brought to public attention in late 2008 by blogger Mike Nolan, who worked as head of web services at Edshill University, just around the corner in Ormskirk. Mike had grown up in the area and was puzzled when he spotted the name Argleton on Google Maps, mainly because this was his old stomping grounds, and he knew for a fact that there was nothing there except a field and maybe a footpath. I, I like Mike's confidence there because, I don't know, I grew up in a in a small village in the middle of nowhere. And there's so many, there's all these tiny little small villages that are super close by. And you'd go to another one and be like, I've lived here for 15 years and I've never been here. I've never been to this random village. And I wouldn't know it existed. I don't know its name. Maybe that's just because I don't like, you know, back in the day, you used to have to follow road signs to places. I always had GPS. Like maybe it wasn't on my phone, but how long I thought was it? Um... Tom Toms, you know, that you'd stick on the, the wing screen. It was a bit <laughs> so now your phone does a job that's a thousand. Does Tom Toms still exist? Are people still buying these? <laughs> Surely not with like ways and stuff. But, you know, I just rely on those so much that there'd be places, I'll just be driving through a place not even looking at signs. Who looks at signs? My dad would my dad would be having a fit at this. He'd be like, what are you talking about? You've got to know the like layouts and the motorways. You've got to know the basic routes. You've got to know this. And I'm like, dad, you don't. You sound like the teacher who was like, you'll never have a calculator in your pocket. And so like, there's what you, you know, you're wrong. You know, that's not how technology works. I don't need to learn any names of roads. My dad's like, oh, you got to learn where the M6 goes. You know, it connects to the M4 and loops around the M25 onto the M20. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't need to know that. I don't care. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've wasted all of this time learning this. Just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about our fantastic sponsor today, Atlas VPN. Look, this is the best VPN deal in the market. Enjoy most affordable online protection. How much does it cost? Just $1.70 a month. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't like it, you can get your money back. But you will like it because what's not to like is Atlas VPN. Unlock your favorite content from all over the world. Uh, My favorite example of this, I think there's actually restrictions on Star Trek. I was going to say The Office US is not available in the US, but you can watch that on European Netflix. So, you know, get an Atlas VPN, jump on over, and you'll get The Office, which I think you have to go to another streaming service to get that in America, which struck me as weird because it's like the American version of The Office. Uh, And I also think you can't get Star Trek. And there's the full Star Trek library in Europe. Not sure about that one. Can't guarantee it. Who knows? Also, you can keep your Google searches private. Or if you're a weirdo and use some other uh, search provider, keep them private. I mean, incognito is not enough. That might hide them from uh, your browser history and stuff, but not from your ISP. Not from your government if you live in one of those scary countries. Stop ads and malware is more than a VPN. It blocks all malicious links, ads, and trackers and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. And you can also save some coins while shopping online. Yes, a uh, classic example. You know when you go on holiday and you're booking a booking a flight or whatever and you come back and it's more expensive that's because they know you look for it fire up that atlas vpn and you'll get the original deal and you can also protect unlimited devices with a single subscription have a private christmas and a safe new year with atlas vpn premium you can have it all for just a dollar 70 a month and six months for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee click the link in the description below and grab this christmas deal right now again that's atlas vpn premium dollar 70 a month and six months for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee click the link in the description below below to get started and now back to today's video 
The following year, Mike's colleague Roy Bayfield, head of marketing at the same Edge Hill University, took it upon himself to go several steps further. With tongue firmly planted, planted in cheek, Roy made his way to the exact location referenced on the map and wrote an entertaining travelogue on his epic trip to the center of Argleton, during which he tried to find hidden meanings in breathtaking sights such as some broken fencing which looked a bit like a rune. Roy later revealed, I started to weave this amazing fantasy about the place, an alternate universe, a Narnia-like world. I was really fascinated by the appearance of a non-existent place that the internet had the power to make real and give semi-existence." End quote. Leaving aside the rune-shaped fencing, clearly a throwback to the days when the town was populated by German dwarves versed in the dark arts of geometric magic, Roy actually found little more than a few empty fields and a footpath. Yet, lurking somewhere in these supposedly empty fields was a buzzing hot spot of local business enterprise. You see, Argleton appeared to expand from its humble roots on Google Maps as it made its leap into various online directories during 2008 and 2009. Aside from the aforementioned golf club, hairdresser's salon, and doctor's surgery, a quick search for Argleton would throw up a hotel, a local plumber, and a chiropractor. You could look for jobs in town and browse property that was available to buy or rent. You could even keep an eye on the weather forecast for Argleton. After all, you don't want to be planning an afternoon golf with the local plumber and chiropractor if all you're just going to do is get caught in a typical Argleton hailstorm. But how did a phantom town manage to drum up so much commercial activity? Were all the businesses just as fictional as the place? Well, that's one mystery we could solve straight away. The listed businesses, including Hope Street Hotel and Moss Hall Golf Club, are very much real. They're just not in Argleton. Wow, I just totally expected them to be made up. Really? Some breeds of business software and online information services extract crucial data from Google, and in this case, the name of the town, along with the genuine L39 postcode, had been lifted from the map and matched up with businesses and online services which shared the same postcode. So, any online search queries related to Argleton would often throw up results relating to businesses and property and weather forecasts within that genuine postcode even if they all fell outside of the silent, empty fields of the town that never was. If an Argleton resident is ever in need of a good local plumber or chiropractor, they're kind of screwed. Well, good news, they're not, because they're not really there. So this is basically, there's a, if I'm understanding this right, there's like a chiropractor, which, why? <laughs> My, uh, like, chiropractor is notoriously, notoriously litigious, so I'm not going to share my opinion on chiropractors. You can probably guess what it is. Well, it's just an opinion for one. But, uh, yeah, chiropractors, please. Um, so there'll be the chiropractor. It'll be located somewhere. And this, you know, Google Maps will be like, oh, because Argleton's this fake town that somewhere exists, they'll be, they'll be just like, well, it's closest to this place. So they mash it in together and then it gets picked up by a business directory. Am I understanding that right? I think so. Still, after the story was picked up by the global media, the Dow town generators a very real interest in merchandising opportunities online. By the end of 2009, you could buy a wide range of Argleton products, including t-shirts which bore the slogan, I visited Argleton and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. How original. A comical website was set up, Argleton.com, which suggested it was run by the forgotten citizens of the town who were now being widely dismissed as a figment of mapmaker's imagination and who were angrily demanding back their identity. I love how much time the internet has. Like, <laughs> people have enough time to just... What are you up to? <laughs> do you not have a job? <laughs> What's going on in your life that you have time to do this? <laughs> the site delved into the fictional backgrounds of the town, took a look at some of the most famous Argletonians from history, and dished up spoof news stories along the lines of last remaining Woolworth store still going strong in Argleton. That is a very niche British joke. Woolworths was the... I never understood Woolworths. It was a store that would sell... Or you could buy a knife, or you could buy some pick-and-mix sweets. Woolworths was bizarre, and that's why it doesn't exist anymore. Anymore because no one's like no one goes to stores like this they just well everyone shops online but you you know you go to short stores that sell random shit stores just don't work do they Meanwhile, the Stanley Arms pub near Ormskirk joined in the fun by serving Argleton Ale to tourists. The landlord refused to reveal the source of the ale, but hinted that the deliveries just magically appeared around the back of the pub every Monday morning. The Stanley Arms also added Argleton pie to the lunchtime menu, a dish notable for its unusual ingredients, which were cheekily listed as nothing at all. But whilst the idea of an invisible town was raising a few giggles and flogging a few t-shirts, the mystery still remained as to why exactly Google had started populating its maps with places that don't even exist. I, I, I think I, I'm just we're winding round through many many pages 
to what I think was my correct answer that I guessed earlier. We'll take the long drive back to Argleton in a little bit to try and shed more light on the mystery, but I thought it would be nice to, to take the scenic route and to spend a little time visiting other places that don't exist along the way. This is certainly not the first time in history that misleading maps have pointed everyone in the wrong direction by creating locations which are pretty tricky to track down in real life. It's one thing for a fictional location to make a brief appearance on a map in cyberspace, but it's another entirely when the fictional location finds itself printed on hundreds of commercial maps for the best part of a century. And that was the case with the Mountains of Kong. <laughs> really? Where are these mountains? If you pick up any map of Africa produced between 1798 and 1888, there's a good chance you'll spot the Mountains of Kong on there, stretching from West Africa near the source of the Niger River in Tembakonda in Guinea, all the way to the Central African Mountains of the Moon, which doesn't exist either, but let's not get bogged down with confusing trivial details. The snow-capped mountains of Kong were said to boast foothills glistening with gold. This should perhaps be served as a big clue that they were not really there. <laughs> Many 19th century explorers attempted to reach the mythical mountains of gold to loot its remarkably well-hidden treasure, and some dubious souls even claimed that they crossed the mountains. It wasn't until 1888 that French explorer Louis Gustave Bijer is spelt Binger but Bijer officially discovered the mountains during an expedition which led him down the Niger River. He certainly found the town of Kong, which was a thriving trading hub, but the mountains were conspicuous by their complete absence. He's, oh man, I was, there was there supposed to be gold everywhere. There's not even a bloody regular mountain. And following this undiscovery, the Phantom Mountains began to crumble into fictitious boulders and tumble into the sea as they completely disappeared from commercial maps by the end of the 19th century. Some of the mistakes we made on maps in the past have been amazing. There's that famous one where it's like the whole of California is just like an island. <laughs> it's like, how did you do that? Did, what? How? <laughs> There's no sea? And the uh, modern maps where it's like, you know, it's never an actual map. It's usually like a world map as like a decoration for a wall or whatever and they're accidentally leaving off New Zealand <laughs> off these maps often and uh, people point this out from New Zealand being like why aren't we on this map <laughs> guys please we exist <laughs> It had all been the fault of Scottish explorer Mungo Park, and particularly the cartographer James Rennell, who were collaborating on a book by the, names of, by the name of Travels in the Interior Districts of Africa. The book revealed the epic tale of Mungo's expedition to West Africa, during which he was told of the existence of the mountains. In his own words, to quote, People inform me that these mountains were situated in a large and powerful kingdom called Kong. End quote. Now, it's worth emphasizing that he never actually claimed to have explored the mountains or even seen a glimpse of them from afar. He just picked up some gossip about them. But when the cartographer James Reynolds dropped the accompanying maps for the book, he included to this unseen mountain range as it fitted neatly with his own theories on the flow of the Niger River. James couldn't understand why the river didn't flow south of the Gulf of New Guinea, and he assumed it was because there was a load of mountains in the way, dripping with gold. It was Mungo's name that was slapped on the cover of the book, so he must surely have given the thumbs up on the map design. Um, yeah, but this was also the past where like history and like fiction and non-fiction just blurred together a lot more than we allow for today despite fictional authors being like all things included in this book are fact and it's like yeah but are they dan are they really both mungo and james were so highly respected that nobody seemed to question their made-up mountains for nearly a hundred years until louis gustave biger finally set the record straight yet they didn't disappear completely in 1928, they mysteriously re-emerged in John Bartholomew's Oxford Advance Atlas, while they also made a surprise guest appearance in Good's World Atlas, published in 1995? That is not that, that is, how long ago is 1995? 30 years ago? Nearly 30 years ago? That's, what, what, was, did Google Maps, ex no, Google Maps definitely didn't exist then, but like, there were proper maps. People, the world had been explored. There were definitely satellite maps. People have been to space. <laughs> Sandy Island is another fictional location which has been making regular appearances on maps since the 18th century, despite the fact that its existence was largely discredited in the 1970s. Indeed, it was still being shown on Google Maps as late as 2012. <laughs> Is that an inside joke or is that like actually mistakes being made until as little as a decade ago? 
The body of land out there in the eastern Coral Sea was meant to be around 3 miles wide and 15 miles long, and it was sandwiched midway between Brisbane in Australia and New Caledonia. Sandy Island was first supposedly spotted in 1772 by explorer Captain James Cook, but didn't find its way onto British, American, and Russian maps until the turn of the 20th century, after its existence had been confirmed by British sailors on board the whaling ship Velocity in 1876. Now, it's possible that Captain Cook and those sailors may have been knocking back too much rum and ended up losing their bearings yeah i don't think this i don't think this is like them making it up right it's just they make some mistake you know when columbus is like i found india and it's like mate you're a little bit off on that one or it could have been a simple navigational error as positioning at sea was obviously a bit more primitive and not entirely reliable back then perhaps it's more likely that they all were actually observing the floating remains of submerged volcano and took it for an exotic island. But some people had lost faith in the existence of Sandy Island by the 1970s, largely because it had not been spotted for nearly a century. The French were the first to remove the island from their hydrographic maps in 1974, and other countries began to follow suit in the 1980s. But not everyone got the memo. Sandy Island could still be spotted on Google Earth well into the 2000s, and it continued to stubbornly make its presence felt on digital databases, including the World Vector Shoreline Database, uh, which is used by the US military. I feel like uh, like jokes can go on Google Maps, but US military, they're probably going to be like, we need accurate maps because we're not trying to find our way to grandma's house. We're trying to invade a country. <laughs> I mean, free, free a country from its oppression. It seems that at some point during the conversion from hard copy maps to digital maps, an outdated physical map, which still displayed the fake islands, was erroneously used, giving a new digitized leaf on, lease on life to the Nowhere Island. Yeah, and if Google says it's there, it's fucking there. Like, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care if you're using your... <laughs> Obviously, it's not there, but it does go to show just how much we rely on something like Google to be like, yes, exists. It's a good job that they weren't using really old maps, otherwise the US could still be factoring in the mountains of Kong into their military maneuvers. Yeah, it's important for military, as we just said. The myth was finally quashed once and for all in 2012, when a crew of scientists aboard the Australian research vessel Southern Surveyor were studying plate tectonics in the Coral Sea. Coral sea and discovered that their maps didn't agree with each other. On the one hand, their scientific charts, which pulled information from the World Vector Shoreline database, seemed to indicate that Sandy Island was meant to be on the horizon. Google Maps concurred, concurred with those findings. Yet the physical navigation charts weren't having any of that nonsense. They insisted there was nothing there, aside from the deep blue sea and maybe an abandoned shopping trolley or two. Sandy Island was finally wiped away from digital maps after the Southern Surveyor confirmed that the physical navigation charts had proved to be the most reliable. Crew member Dr. Maria Seton revealed we all had a good giggle at Google as we sailed right through the island. Some maps are the result of people just clearly pissing about. Two new towns suddenly popped up out of nowhere on the 1978-1979 edition of the official state map of Michigan. The curiously named towns of B Botasu and Goblu had been planted not in Michigan itself, but just over the border in neighboring Ohio. And this raised a few quizzical eyebrows in both states as neither town had existed in the 1977-1978 edition. That was the edition to previous year. There were a couple of odd things about the new towns. The names weren't capitalized like every other location on the map, and there were no specific markers or boundary lines to ascertain their precise location. But the oddest thing of all is that the cartographers had actually been under strict instructions to include the fake towns purely to piss off supporters of the Ohio State football team. Okie dokie. Peter Fletcher was a lifelong resident of. Oh my lord, how do you say that? Why? Double, it's spelt Y P S I L A N T I. Ypsilanti? <laughs> Who puts a Y and a P together, America? That's not okay. In Michigan, with a ma uh, massive supporter of the Wolverines, the football team representing the University of Michigan, who enjoyed a fierce rivalry with the Buckeyes, the team representing Ohio State University. Peter was also an entrepreneur, a Republican activist, and more significantly, he was chairman of the Michigan State Highway Commission, who had a personal say in what exactly appeared on official maps. The towns of Botasu and Goblu were nothing more than a cheeky dig at his football team's arch rivals. Goblu was a reference to the chant Go Blue, which echoed around the stadium in support of the blue shirts of the Wolverines, whilst Botasu simply stood for Beat Ohio State University. I mean, okay. <laughs> this is like, dude, again, it's, we found someone who just has too much time on their hands. Yeah, lucky bastard. Many Ohio residents expressed their distaste 
for the gag and demanded a corrected reprint. And even some Michigan residents complained that it was a waste of taxpayers' money to print up three million of these mirthful maps. Well, they were printing the maps anyway, so unless they're going to reprint everything, and in that case, I'll be like, yeah, it's a huge waste of money. You shouldn't have done that, and he, the guy who did this should be fired because that's how much is it per map? It's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot. That seems a little harsh, considering that it can't cost more than a few dollars to scribble down two new town names on a Michigan map, and it didn't actually affect anything inside the borders of Michigan anyway. The fact that Peter always declined his annual salary of $60,000 as chairman of the State Highway Commission should have more than compensated for the extra three minutes of work that went into the maps. Wow, <laughs> you know you're a gangster, and it's like, no, 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 I don't need a salary. I just, uh, I just, I'll work for free. I'll just, 60000 I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm, I'm independently wealthy. This has got to be nice, right? Just to, why do you do this job? I just feel like it. That I need to get paid. <laughs> Although, if I was, I, as someone who like works with people and pays people, and someone was like, I'll work for free, I'm always very hesitant because it's like when I pay you, you have to do what I say. <laughs> like, it's like if you deliver me like script writing, great example. If someone's like, yeah, I made this script for you and it's for free, I'll be like, look, but then I can't give you feedback and I can't tell you that, you know, I don't want this bit to be like that and I don't want this to be like that because you did it for free. <laughs> when I'm paying you, it's like, no, I need it to be like I asked. And so, yeah. And also like even another job, like, well, you go to Starbucks and you work for free or whatever because you just love making coffee. The boss is going to be like, no, no, we need to pay you. One, because we're a giant company and that's how this shit works. And two, I need you to work for me. Like you just can't come, like I, you, if you signed up for a shift on Friday and I'm not paying you, then what guarantee do I have that you're just going to be like, no, I don't feel like coming. Uh, you're not paying me, so I'm not going to. And we rely on you. This is why it's, you know, that was a big tangent for just a dude turning down a salary. <laughs> Sorry, let's carry on. The towns disappeared for the following year's edition, whilst the 1978-1979 edition is now a highly prized collector's piece for fans of the Wolverines. And the fake towns have provided a bit of inspiration for Peter's team, as the Wolverines thrashed the back eyes 14-3 in that year's clash. I'm sure it had everything to do with that map. Here, here, that was sarcasm. You really need to be careful when it comes to purposefully inventing fictional map locations, though I'm pretty sure that's how Finland got willed into existence. Yeah, there's a conspiracy theory that Finland doesn't exist, right? <laughs> Is it Finland? I think it's Finland. On a slightly more disturbing note, it was practically impossible for a citizen of the Soviet Union to buy a local map that made any kind of sense between the late 1930s through until 1988. Yeah, the Soviets were famous for messing around with the maps. And that's because the map information was deliberately falsified for a period of over 50 years. Only the military were allowed to get their hands on real maps, while everybody else had to make do with comedy concoctions that were about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. There was a reason behind the deception. The Soviet Soviets were so worried about the threats of aerial bombing and enemy intelligence operations that they placed cartography under control of the security police. The cartographers were instructed to distort boundaries, miss out significant geo geographical features, move rivers and roads around a bit, and fabricate entire streets, all in the name of protecting the motherland. Sounds like the perfect job for the creatively frustrated cartographer who missed out on his true vocation of designing fantasy maps for Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. To be fair, it proved to be a pretty effective strategy. During the Second World War, General Gunther Blumentritt led his German troops in an attempted invasion of the Soviet Union, but came a bit unstuck when he realized that the maps they were using in no way corresponded with reality. That's kind of brilliant. I mean, you can have a lot of very frustrated citizens, but on the other hand, it's gonna, it is absolutely military genius. I feel like this is the sort of shit that Sun Tzu would write about. After getting lost and wandering around in circles for hours, his troops eventually managed to get all of their vehicles stuck in the unexpected mud of a chunk of remote countryside that wasn't meant to be there <laughs> on the map really hard road excellent for invading reality marshland the problem is that tourists and citizens were also getting hopelessly lost for 50 years and it makes you wonder why the soviet union even bothered to continue producing maps at all american diplomats are journal well because it's kind of propaganda not propaganda um deception because it's like if uh, american spies managed to get their hands on soviet maps or just buy soviet maps off like map shops or whatever dot <laughs> I'm trying to think. What would the domain be? Did the Soviet Union ever have a domain? <laughs> Shit. It, it, Internet 1990. Yeah, it probably did, right? That's pretty wild. I wonder what that was. Dot SU? Probably dot SU. That's crazy. Never even thought about that. Um, and then if the enemies think they've got the, the maps, then they're not going to do their own research. But if they're like, there are no maps, then they have to go make their own maps through like spies and um, 
planes and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't until 1998, American diplomats and journalists working in Moscow figured out the best way of getting hold of a reliable map of the Soviet Union was to have one imported from almost any other country in the world. It wasn't until 1988 that the Soviet Union finally admitted to falsifying maps and agreed to start producing new maps with more of a focus on accuracy and truth. This put an end to regular high-profile complaints about the useless fake maps, including this observation in the evening paper, Virchenaya, Moskva, to quote, You can get maps of our country in many other countries of the world except for the USSR, from whom, one wonders, are we keeping secrets? From ourselves. However, it's the fictional town of Aglo in New York which perhaps provides a compelling clue as to the origins of our equally fictional town of Argleton. The thing about Aglo is that it really was a trap. A paper trap. Many maps purposefully contain hidden distinctive and fictitious details that don't really exist, hidden away in alleyways and darker corners of the globe. They're a cunning attempt to prevent copyright violation. See, this is the one I knew. I can't imagine just how much time and effort and cups of strong coffee go into putting together an accurate map. I get deeply befuddled from just trying to plot a steady course to the nearest kebab house on the back of a beer mat. Yet, yeah, the uh, we, we have these things in the UK called Ordnance Survey Maps, which are just wildly detailed. They'll tell you like, ah, oh, yeah, the, the ground there raises by like half a meter. There's a, like a bluff there. There's this type of tree here. It's really very detailed and very impressive. And the amount of time and effort that must go into making that shit is incredible. But after going to all of the effort to craft your own map, the last thing you want to do is for somebody just to come along and steal it. It's usually pretty easy to figure out that somebody has plagiarized, say, a piece of original fiction like a novel or a movie script. But it comes much harder when you start dealing with the details of reality found in maps and encyclopedias. If some other unscrupulous company out there ever decides to take a devious short cut and simply replicates your existing map instead of producing their own, it can be difficult to argue your case as you're dealing with the mapping of real locations and you can't claim copyright over facts. But you could always try laying down a sneaky trap for the unwary copycat by planting a small fictitious detail in your own map. If these same details pop up on a commercial map produced by another company, it's easier to prove they've pretty much just stolen your work. These copyright traps are often called paper towns, trap streets, or my own personal favorite, mount weasels. Oh my, I like that. This last name refers to not a paper town or a paper mountain, but a paper person. The 1975 New Columbia Encyclopedia features a bogus entry titled Lillian Virginia Mount Weasel, which was designed to catch out plagiarists. The woman, who never existed, was supposedly a fountain designer turned photographer who met a tragic end when she died during an explosion while working on an assignment for Combustibles magazine. That is elaborate and brilliant and these uh, <laughs> i feel like look, I, i've been the victim of plagiarism and i feel like this would be quite fun to include just these extra details except on youtube the comments will be like simon what are you talking about it never happened like that that's not real because the internet there's comments not many map producers openly admit to using trap streets in their work although it's alleged the popular publications such as london's a to z street atlas contain no less than a hundred different traps in just a single city but when i first heard about this i started to feel a little concerned couldn't these paper towns potentially lead to a complete confusion at best and outright danger at worst um isn't it normally it's not like it'd be unusual for them to do a whole town it'd be like okay so this back street doesn't exist or it says there's a payphone there when there's not really a payphone not that there are payphones anywhere anymore but you know what i mean it's something harmless i suppose it's not the end of the world if you they're not going to be like yeah 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 hospital with accident emergency <laughs> poison center these kind of things they're not going to do that because that would be seriously irresponsible i suppose it's not the end of the world if you happen to get lost in an imaginary town while you're desperately looking for a chiropractor who's still open at midnight but imagine if you were trying to rush your pregnant wife to hospital and you ended up accidentally taking a wrong turn into the canal or imagine if you called the emergency services for urgent assistance but after consulting a map of lies you tell them that you'll be waiting on the corner of cock and bull lane in the village of wonky chicken it might take them a very long time to reach you i was amazed the other day a um, couple of months ago, actually, had a car accident, and apparently, like, I don't, I don't know this. I'd never really been in a car accident before. It was very minor, but apparently, you have to phone the police. And so my wife's like, she phones the police because um, she speaks Czech. Obviously, I, I speak, I can, I can get, I can get by a little bit. Um, but so she phones the police, and she's like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, they're like, where are you? She, or no, they don't ask where she is. They're like, are you standing outside this like number? like on the street 
it was insane <laughs> like it was like yes that is exactly where i'm standing and they know it within seconds so are they looking at the gps in your phone or are they like getting it some other way because it's just like i was amazed at how they can pinpoint your location so precisely it freaked me out and then they were like yeah we'll be there in like an hour <laughs> oh brilliant thanks so just standing around with two kids going crazy while the police come up to take photos and shit i'm like it's not even that bad i don't understand why you have to do this well apparently this should never happen as the traps are usually more subtle than that instead of fabricating entire streets and villages and towns and countries the sensible map makers are content to plant their small copyright traps in alleyways or dead-end streets or somewhere completely out of the way some of the traps will be as small and discreet as an extra cul-de-sac or an exaggerated bend in a road just something that will be distinctive enough to prove plagiarism but not a big enough part but not big enough to get their customers walking into walls or falling down wells yet some map makers have been known to take things a little too far and in the case of the paper town of aglo in upstate new york a well-prepared trap didn't quite spring as planned the town of aglo first appeared on road maps in 1937. in reality the location was nothing more than a desolate dirt track which sat between the town of rockland and the beaverkill river jesus <laughs> the river's called beaverkill <laughs> but on paper this small stretch of nothing had been given the name aglo by the major map makers general drafting company it had been decided that this was a perfect spot to drop a copyright trap which was named after the initials of the company's director and his assistant otto g Lindbergh and ernest alpers this fake town was still appearing exclusively on general drafting company road maps by the 1950s at which point the famous map company rand mcnally appeared to fall right into the trap they produced a new map of their own which included the phantom town of aglo the lawyers for the general drafting company must have been rubbing their hands with glee if you know these things exist why would you copy someone's map because you're going to get caught <laughs> This was surely an open and shut case. Rand McNally had been caught red-handed, and now these blatant copyrights would have to give a, cough up a small fortune for daring to venture into a town that was created by their competitors. Or at least, that's what you would think, but Rand McNally completely got away with it. Okay, never mind, I take it all back. A few years after the General Drafting Company first put Aglo on the map, a fishing lodge had popped up near that desolate dirt track, which had proudly been christened Aglo Lodge. And by 1950s, a new store had apparently opened on the location, and this business very briefly traded under the name aglo general straw i say very briefly because it didn't stay open very long at all possibly because the owner had foolishly decided to open a general store slap bang in the middle of nowhere in both cases the proprietors had apparently picked up a general drafting company map from their local esso gas station and decided to name their new business ventures after the relevant location labeled clearly on the map rand mcnally claimed that when they were drafting their own map they'd noted the names of businesses operating in the area and concluded that aglo must indeed be a real place although i couldn't dig up concrete information it would appear that the courts agreed and rand mcnally was cleared of any wrongdoing an alternative version of the story which rarely gets reported was put forward by darlene beers who lived nearby and whose great-great-grandfather owns the original version of the fishing lodge J lodge darlene claimed that the general store never existed she also claimed that the fishing lodge was only given the name aglo after a great-great-grandfather sold it to a mysterious entity by the name of aglo associates in the 1950s wait 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 is it is it really that the company that was caught doing the copyright thing allegedly was like uh-oh quick let's uh create a company name it after this town and buy the fishing lodge in there rename it that so that when the courts look at it that is fucking sneaky if true and kind of genius well i'm impressed the implication seems to be that aglo associates was allegedly a front for rand mcnally who had come to the conclusion that it was cheaper to rebrand an old fishing lodge than it was to lose a lawsuit for copyright infringement that is all very alleged and speculation but if so genius move guys but whatever the finer details the rise and fall of aglo is a fascinating tale as it's the story of a paper town which essentially took on a life of its own and became real for well over 70 years until it sadly blinked out of existence again aglo continued to appear on maps and travel guides right up until the 2010s although it now seems to have disappeared and it was finally pulled from google maps in 2014. maybe the old dirt track at least deserves some kind of commemorative plaque or something this is a move which has been supported over the years by aglo truthers 
but the only problem is that nobody can agree on where exactly they should put it. And it does make you ponder just how easy it might be to randomly invent a new official place that becomes widely accepted by the rest of the world. Back when I was a teenager growing up in Rotherham, I used to hang around with a group of reprobates in a place we called Happy Corner. Of course, that wasn't its real name, and it never appeared on the map. It was actually just a tiny service road which was intended to lead to a new estate that was never built. Yeah, those it's like you see these sometimes where you're like driving around a roundabout, or there's some like road that just goes to nowhere, and there's like one of those concrete bollards at the end, and it's all grown over. There's uh if you're driving from to the airport in Prague from the center of town, there's like this uh, exit off the highway that's just blocked off and grown over with grass. And every time I drive by it, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna look up what that was supposed to go to because this is a big like turning off the highway street uh, highway road, and I'm always curious about it, and then I always forget. And I'm like, now after this video, I'm going to look it up, but I'll probably forget then as well. It's the story of my life. But it was a fairly remote location out of everybody's way in which dreams were shared, long-term friendships were forged, cheap cider was drunk, noses were broken, strange pills were swallowed, and life milestones were marked. Happy Corner deserved a place on the map, and looking back now, all it might have taken to convince the cartographers of its authenticity would have been the installation of a Happy Corner gumball machine. Many people seem to have reached the conclusion that all of this helps to explain how Argotten in Lancaster briefly flickered into existence. Argotten was nothing more than a trap town cooked up by Google in a bid to detect any copyright violation. It's been suggested that they even left small clues in the name Argleton, which is an anagram of not real G, with the, suppose, with the G supposedly representing Google. That is a bit of a stretch. That sounds a little unlikely to me, though. For starters, it's a shit anagram. If Google really was having a private giggle with the naming of a paper town, I think they would have come up a bit better. I think they would have come up with something better, like Booby Pit. Or perhaps Gamgo Chatterbay Hishi Congo, which is an anagram of gotcha you cheating scumbag but i also think that google would be considerably cleverer in capturing counterfeit copyright crooks almost two decades before the appearance of argoton the ordnance survey mapping agency in great britain won a considerable payout from automobile association after it caught them copying maps that dated back to the early 1990s the case dragged on until 2001 when the aa eventually agreed to pay a settlement of no less than 20 million pounds after the motoring club conceded that their processes in producing the 500 different maps and atlases in dispute had not been as robust as they could have been that is some settling language right there it's like no 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 we're not admitting faults oh uh, it's just we could have been more robust in our in our research and gone to more than one source allegedly <laughs> But the copyright traps laid down by Ordnance Survey had in no way involved the creation of entire towns or streets. Instead, they had used rather more sophisticated fingerprint techniques, which focused on subtle stylistic features such as the details in proportioning and the specific width of roads, rather than anything that could potentially mislead a customer. Considering that Ordnance Survey had this kind of thing cracked by the 1990s, it seems incredibly unlikely that a big tech, tech company like Google would resort to clumsily slapping a whole fictional town onto their maps in 2008 as an effective strategy to prevent copyright. Perhaps the most likely explanation for Argleton is one that was actually suggested right back at the very beginning when local blogger Mike Nolan first spotted it on a map in 2008. Although the suggestion was dismissed by many, it was just a simple cock-up. Mike pointed out that the real village of Orton is only a few hundred meters away from the rogue town, and the misspelling of this may have been keyed into Google. The two words, Orton and Argleton, which uh, would have looked very similar, particularly if the cartographer had been working from an old document written in cursive text. Professor Danny Dorling, the former president of the British Cartographic Society, agrees that it was probably just an embarrassing blunder. He observed, I would bet this is an innocent mistake. In other words, it was not intentionally inserted to catch out anyone infringing the map's copyright as some are saying but the bottom line is that we don't know what mapping companies do to protect their maps or to hide secret locations as some are obligated to do however the reason that this is often dismissed is because the name orton also appeared on the google maps so it wasn't as if argleton was an erroneous replacement for a real village it was more like a new neighborhood that existed very near the clearly visible orton but if you dig a little deeper into the local geography, you'll see that it gets a bit confusing. Orton is the name of an estate and a village. Orton is the name of an estate and village and civil parish. There are residents who technically live in Orton Park Estate in the village of Orton in the parish of Orton. Doki doki. The location of Argleton still doesn't make complete sense on the map, but maybe the cartographer just got confused as every other normal person who lives on proper streets and villages and parishes that bother to come up with different names 
for everything around them. It might have helped make things clearer if Google had provided a half decent explanation. Instead, they appeared to acknowledge that mistakes can happen, but passed the buck to the Netherlands based company Teleatlas, who were responsible for providing them the data. But they didn't seem to know how it happened either. I mean, it's not unreasonable. Google's like, we don't know how it happens. Danny's like, I want more information. It's like, Danny, they don't have it, though. They just don't know. They're just like, Teleatlas might know. That's, that's as far as we could go. I'm sorry, carry on. But Teleatlas didn't seem to know how it happened either. The vice president recently admitted that they can usually track down exactly where they source their data from. But in the case of Argoton, all records had been mysteriously lost. And I don't know about you, but as soon as I hear about records getting mysteriously lost, I immediately assume that you're talking about a government cover-up involving alien crop circles. Steady on, Danny. Sadly, Google won't give you directions to Argoton today. The location was briefly marked as closed by Google before it was removed in 2010, reappearing just briefly a few years later as a historical landmark before permanently sinking from view like an invisible island in the eastern coral sea. But here's a closing thought. If it wasn't simply a mistake, then maybe it really was a copyright trap after all. A copyright trap that Google themselves fell into. Perhaps the company got fed up with crafting their own maps and just decided to copy an old map that they found in a dusty cupboard which had been created by the famous explorer Captain George Litigious Trousers in 1789. I find this unlikely. As soon as they realized their mistake, they quickly covered it up and pretended that it never happened, hoping that Captain George Litigious Trousers was probably too dead by now to file a lawsuit. But I'd care to wager every last speck of gold on them foothills of the mountains of Kong that this was just a case of human blundering while rather than map trap plundering. I agree, Danny. I think we've come to exactly the same conclusion at the end. It was just a bit of a mistake. Anyway, thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode all about map traps, which I didn't know were a thing, but then I found out were a thing and yeah if you enjoy the show please leave it a review if you're listening as a podcast it also does go out on youtube if you want to watch me read these things um subscribe like and i'll see you next time